I'm Harold Cox from the Public Health School, and I want to welcome you to another one of our conversations about contemporary public health concerns. Um, we are planning a number of issues and a number of, of um, fora and symposia, and the next one will be on gun control. We're also looking at an issue concerning reproductive rights, and you will have an opportunity to see those as they are advertised. But today our conversation is about the crisis in Europe. This is something that has certainly caught all of our attention and certainly something that all of us should be very aware of and is clearly the right issue for us to be considering today. Today we have a distinguished panel who will assist us with this conversation and they represent a number of different aspects of this. We are, have someone who's going to be able to talk about what's happening on the ground, someone who's going to be able to talk about the health concerns, as well as someone who can talk about the political and practical issues of resettlement. Specifically, I'm, I'm grateful to our panelists who are with us. To my far left is Amy Slaughter, who is the Chief Strategy Officer at Refuge Point. Refuge Point is located in Cambridge, and it works on durable solutions for refugees. Next to Amy is, is Maria Sacchetti, who is a reporter at the Boston Globe, who does work in the area of immigration and who was recently in Europe looking uh, and understanding the issue that we're going to be talking about today. <coughs> and our moderator for today is Dr. Sandra Crosby, who is an associate professor here at the Public Health School and at the School of Medicine. Dr. Crosby is also a director and co-founder of the Immigrant and Refugee Health Program at Boston Medical Center. Please give a hand to our panelists. Thank you, Harold, and thank all of you for, for coming out this afternoon. We hope this will be a lively conversation um, with Maria and Amy here, and hopefully with participation from all of you at the last 15 minutes. So as people know, we are in the midst of the largest refugee crisis ever on record. We've now surpassed the crisis after World War II, and although the title suggests this is a European problem, this is really an international, worldwide problem for which we all share some collective responsibility. According to the last statistics given by the UN, at the end of 2014, there were 60 million people displaced worldwide, although that number is clearly much larger now. One in every 122 human beings on the earth is either now displaced, a refugee, or an asylum seeker. And today we're going to talk about the, the situation in Syria as, as part of this crisis. We know the, the war in Syria has create, created untenable conditions, forcing the exodus of refugees into surrounding countries, notably Turkey, Lebanon, um, Jordan, Iraq, and also now forcing large number, numbers to make the dangerous journey to Europe. Almost 600,000 people have made that journey to Europe this year alone, half of them Syrians. So there are other refugee groups in the world it's important to remember, notably Afghanistan, Iraq, Eastern Africa, and other groups. Since the beginning of the Syrian war, over 250,000 people have died, and 12 million have fled their homes. 4 million into neighboring countries, and about 8 million displaced with inside Syria. Um, and it's really stretched the capacity of the neighboring countries to accept and to handle this influx of, of the refugees. Another thing notable about this war that's different than, than previous wars is that the laws of medical neutrality have not been respected. Um, hospitals and doctors have been targeted, destabilizing the whole medical infrastructure within Syria. Physicians for Human Rights is a group with which I've worked and others in the audience have worked with and have been documenting and reporting on attacks on hospitals. They've now recorded over 300 attacks on medical installations and the targeted deaths of approximately 700 health professionals. Um, 
what is also is important to remember is that Syria is so destabilized, it's really difficult to get accurate numbers. So we really don't know the true number of people that have died in hospitals that are targeted. In recent weeks, I think everybody in this country, um, not only in this room, were riveted by the image of a small Syrian child who washed up on the shore of Turkey um, dead. And all told now, approximately um, 3,000 people have died making that dangerous journey from Turkey and Northern Africa to Europe on rafts, on unstable boats. More than 10,000 continue to flow into Europe on a daily basis as we speak. Um, so as you can see, this is an ongoing situation. It's an ongoing crisis that we all need to be you know, prepared to respond to. And I'd like to start with Maria, who was recently in Europe and actually witnessed the influx of, of migrants there. Um, Tell us your impressions. What did you see? Who were the migrants that, that you spoke to? Well, so um, thank you all for, for coming, by the way. Thank you for having us. Um, we, uh, so the first thing we did was go to the Greek island of Lesbos. And there was some discussion, actually, about whether we should have started in Macedonia or somewhere else, kind of catch up to where the news was. And I felt strongly that we should go to where it was starting, um, although they, you know, at least where it was arriving, in the, the kind of influx was arriving in Europe. I don't know if this is working. Um, and, uh, and I was a little concerned because everybody we talked to kept saying, oh, you know, you missed it. The news was last week. Everybody's gone. You know, they put um, thousands of people on, on, uh, on big boats and they took them to the Greek mainland. But actually we found um, the opposite, that even though there, wasn't, there weren't 25,000 people, you could still see hundreds arriving all the time. And you just go to the edge of the water and, um, and you see kind of these little black dots in the distance. Beautiful, incredibly beautiful island. Tourists hiking and all of this. And they just keep floating over. And Sorry, I'm having trouble with my microphone. Um, so some boats, you know, you would, people would be coming over singing happy songs. Um, uh, they, were, they were like these rubber rafts, and um, they were uh, blown up, and, uh, and they had uh, outboard motors attached to them, and clearly for boats of um, much smaller size. Uh, and, uh, and so those that made it, people were happy, joyous. They took out selfie sticks and were taking pictures of themselves and calling their moms in Iran or, or Iraq or uh, Syria, you know, Syria if they could. Um, and then others were incredibly grim. You know, you could see people, they would um, have their children just um, in the middle so that they couldn't fall out. They were uh, sobbing. Um, and we saw, we saw one boat that just stopped a few hundred yards offshore and they were blowing emergency whistles and, um, and we, there was nothing we could do. We were all looking at each other and someone said, you know, call the Coast Guard. But the Coast, I mean, everybody knows this is happening and there's no, no help for them. So people had to jump off the raft and kind of kick their way to shore. Um, and they were freezing. They were so cold. Uh, it was all the time this was happening. So. Um, how were the, the communities handling the influx? I mean, what did you... So and on the island of Lesbos, I mean, we saw um, people were... Uh, there was a mix, you know, there were mixed feelings. I mean, this is a place, uh, Greeks, as everybody knows, is having an economic crisis. I mean, I think uh, if you're a Greek, you can't take more than $60 out of your ATM every day. Um, unemployment's at 25%. And so these islands live off tourists. So one night we saw um, a rescue. It, it was interesting, we were staying at a little tavern. Um, it, it was like a little pension for like $30 a night. It was, um, it was right in the ocean, so you could see the boats coming in. And, uh, and, and the tavern owner said to me, there's no way anyone's going to cross tonight because the waters are way too choppy. And many more did. They tried to cross anyway, which was really striking to me because I thought, okay, well, we're done. We can go file some, a story. And instead, you know, uh, someone said, no, we have to go back out. Um, they're coming in. And fishermen were um, in these like, little dinghies were um, towing in this, like, a lifeboat. People thought it would be safer. It was sort of like an an old lifeboat like from a cruise ship or something and it was just loaded with people, loaded with children. And it pulls up into this tourist area and so people are having their Greek salads and having white wine and then all of a sudden everybody looks up and out of the pitch black darkness you see this boat filled with refugees. It was like a picture from like a hundred years ago, it was extraordinary. And, uh, and people poured out and this one woman came, they started taking the kids off first and you could see like some of the toddlers weren't quite ready to walk yet, you know, and um, so they were kind of struggling. Um, and so this woman in this elegant white dress just comes flying at the kids and just starts scooping them up until you realize she couldn't carry, there were so many she couldn't hold them all. And so other people had to come in 
But then we saw other people who were just standing there with arms folded, um, and they, they were very upset because they felt like this crisis was hurting the economy of the island. So it was an interesting So did you situation. actually get to talk to some of the migrants and get personal stories from them? Yes. I mean, we, we, talked, to, we talked to lots of people. I mean, um, everyone's story was a little bit different. I mean, the people from Syria were especially um, afraid. They were really afraid for their families back home. Um, they didn't want their pictures taken. Um, they wanted their stories told, but they, they were terrified, especially of the government. You know, we read a lot about ISIS, um, and they're afraid of ISIS too, but they seemed most afraid of the, the government, according to the anecdotal stories we, we heard. So. Can you share a particularly compelling story that you've heard? Um, th this would have been um, uh, kind of in one of the processing centers where I saw a man who um, uh, who was struggling to walk, and he uh, told us the story of being, I mean, I can't independently verify this, but he told us the story of being at a peace protest and, um, and in Syria and having um, his arm grabbed by an officer and, and turned, and, um, and then he, was, um, he said he was bayoneted, and he said that there was a scar right along his spine, and now he can't walk very well, and his, his best friend was helping him, so he was walking with him on this, this journey. So yeah, we, saw, we saw a lot of injuries. Really powerful. What was the most like hopeful thing you saw? Did people have stories of hope? Oh, and um, well, I mean, I think uh, just the, you know, the, it's, it's an, that's a great question um, that I don't remember. Um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, just just the sense of, of pressing forward. You know, I mean, people were so urgently trying to get to the next place um, and that they, they just weren't going to stop. I mean, it's really tough journey, you know, like not only the boat, but then you have to walk so long, and, um, and then which country is going to let you pass, and some got tear gassed at the Hungarian border, and, and they just kept going. It was uh, really incredible. So. Well, no, and your stories in the Globe have been, have been really incredible. Oh, thank you. So if people haven't seen them, um, be sure to take a look. Um, I'm going to go to Amy next. And you know, just to, to preface this, I mean, I'm not an, a policy expert um, at all. I've been to the Syrian border approximately five times. And back in 2012, I wrote an op-ed. Um, and 2012, and what I would said was that the humanitarian situation is urgent and escalating daily. By ignoring it, we are forsaking our own humanity. So that was three years ago. Could we have seen this coming, um, Amy? And what, what should we have done early on? Um, what's happened since and what, what's happening now? Yeah, well, thank you also for having me here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, many did, did see it coming, like you. Aid agencies on the ground saw it coming. They've been ringing alarm bells for years. It's a crisis that's been brewing for five years. Many of the refugees have been in exile for five years since the start of the Syrian war. And um, it, it wasn't until it started reaching the, the doorstep of Europe that it got so much media attention. But the aid agencies in particular, sorry, um, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and the World Food Program have very um, forcefully been ringing alarm bells over their, um, the dwindling funds that they had to support this massive refugee crisis that was continuing year after year. There were um, over two million people on, on food aid uh, for five years. That was unsustainable. And one of the major push factors that prompted the timing of this mass movement to Europe was that the World Food Program had to just cut back their uh, food rolls very drastically in August and September. So they had to knock about a third of the, um, the beneficiaries off of food, and those that stayed on uh, food assistance, they had to cut it in half. So that was a huge push factor out of the host countries surrounding Syria. Um, there were additional push and pull factors that, that prompted this, the movement that we're seeing now. Um, obviously, the deterior, deteriorating situation within Syria, uh, a growing frustration with the few legal channels to migrate that do exist, and the long delays in those processes, for instance, resettlement to the U.S. and resettlement to other countries, are very long processes with long delays, and just mounting frustration over that. 
combined with the fact that the sea gets rougher as winter approaches, there was a window of opportunity. And then I would say the, the final uh, factor was Germany's announcement at the end of August that it would accept any asylum seeker from Syria that reached Germany, um, which uh, overturned the Dublin Agreement, which the EU had uh, developed in the 90s, saying that refugees have to apply for asylum in the first EU country that they reach. Um, and so the policy had been in the past that if an asylum seeker reaches Germany by way of Hungary, um, Austria, however they travel, the obligation would be to deport them back to that first country. So they suspended that agreement, which sort of opened the floodgates in a little bit. And I, I know that there's been some criticism or an, um, on that decision, whether it was fully thought through in terms of the consequences. Um, so those, I would say, are the main factors that sort of led to the, the timing of the mass movement. But I think whether it happened now or later, it was going to happen. Um, and I think one of the reasons is um, the, the humanitarian system is simply bankrupt. Um, and that we are asking the humanitarian t system to do something that it was not created to do. And that is sustain these refugees in, uh, in exile for decades. And crises are not resolving themselves. Refugees are staying refugees longer and longer. The average duration is 20 years now. And so the head of the uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees in Jordan called this a failure of the international refugee protection regime. But I would say it's, it's bigger than that. that. It's asking the regime to do something that it never should have been asked to do. At some point when crises um, are protracted, it, there needs to be a handoff to development actors, to host countries, to start to uh, integrate and mainstream refugees into the services of those countries. And that doesn't happen. And this, the incentive systems are not set up for that to happen. So the political will in the host countries surrounding Syria is not there to allow the refugees to work, to the kids to go to school. So they were living in a very parallel universe that became really unsustainable. So I mean, really our whole current humanitarian response strategy has failed. And it's been failing. We should have seen it coming, perhaps. Um, and it's now time to, to build something new. Um, practically, so we have hundreds of thousands of refugees now. What, what is the process for, for Europe, especially, that are receiving these refugees um, to, to get processed and, and to move on to find integration for them? I think one question is how to absorb those that have already arrived. And yes, that's a big question, and I don't envy the people that have to do that. Um, as somebody who has had to set up m massive processing um, programs to process large numbers of refugees, it's not easy. And I have a lot of sympathy for these countries that are suddenly having to create these um, the logistics and bureaucracy around that. But I, I think that that's, they will be absorbed eventually. The capacity is there. The wealth is there in Europe. They will get absorbed. I think what maybe is a more interesting question is to you know future arrivals and anticipating that this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's still those eight million IDPs internally displaced within Syria. There's still the the three point some million that haven't fled from the neighboring countries, and the conditions are not improving for any of them. So I think we we do need to realize that this is a whole new day in terms of migration policy, and uh, need to shift the conversation from how to keep people out to how to best manage these crises and maximize the positives, the contributions that refugees bring, and minimize in the negatives associated with it. Yeah, I, no, I, I totally agree. And I think that's what experts in the field are calling for now. I mean, just in, in terms of US processing, there's so many inefficiencies. And there was just a, an article um, in the Times this weekend talking about how the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon was closed due to remodeling, and so they've been unable to process refugees since September 2014, which is over a year ago. Um, it just seems the system really is broken and, and needs a complete restructuring. Could I add something actually yeah. to my last comment? And that is, there a suggestion has been put forth that I think is a fairly, uh, that has some, some merit at least, should be looked into to um, outpost consular offices from European governments to the transit points where refugees are, are boarding these dangerous journeys. 
uh, to issue humanitarian visas if um, they, uh, on a kind of prima facie basis at first glance, if it appears that they probably have a refugee claim, to issue a humanitarian visa, allow them to fly like a modern person to Europe, cheaper than paying a smuggler and much safer than taking a dangerous journey. Well, I think one thing in my mind is why are we continuing to allow these women and children and refugees to come over on rafts? Why don't we just get planes and put them on and, and help them travel safely? I, I don't know. Amy or uh, um, Maria, it, any observations in your recent No, I mean, that, that's a, that's a, that was a constant question. You know, you just sort of, um, I mean, every, it was under everybody's noses, you know? I mean, everybody knows they're coming across in these boats. Everybody knows people are drowning, you know? I mean, all the time. I, mean, I think the day after um, we left the Greek island, you know, you, that was uh, where it was um, Pharmaconisi, I think, where they had a, few, a couple dozen people drown, including children. It was horrible. Uh, and, and the same thing when you see people, like at one, one point we're in, um, in Serbia on the border with Croatia and, uh, and we just were, were at this crossroads in cornfields and Croatia had closed its border, but they said to the refugees, well, you can cross illegally, you can walk over through these cornfields. I think it was like five kilometers, it was almost 100 degrees, old people, injured people, children, um, and, uh, and all of a sudden these two big white buses pull up and, and all these refugees get out. And they start walking, and all the all the officers on the Croatian side and the Serbian side just sat there and watched them do it. And I remember I went up to some Serbian officers. And I was like, "What's going on?" And they were just like, "It's the politicians," you know. That was really fascinating, and it's something that you would just—it was astounding because you you know it was a very arduous journey and um, something I've never seen before. Certainly, uh, and just, I, I, they just sat and watched, and some people got sick along the route, and the police, you know, would would go to help them, but they were really pretty much on their own. Yeah, I mean, well, 3,000 died making the journey right. that we know of so far. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about the health issues of these large, large migrant populations um, that are coming from conflict areas and from very dangerous situations. Um, for, for people arriving to Europe anyway, I know they try to do um, cursory health evaluations immediately upon arrival, just um, looking at brief screenings, um, infectious diseases, et cetera. But certainly that system has been overwhelmed by the sheer numbers. Um, and some of the reports that I've been reading are people are coming with injuries from Syria, um, dehydration from the journey, like foot injuries, skin infections, um, things like that. Maria, what did you, yeah. you said a little bit that people were sick. Did you see anything else specific, any other health issues um, or concerns? Yeah, no, it's exactly those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, you know, a lot of the kids and the, and, well, and the adults too, of course, were sleeping on the ground. So they were getting, you know, bug bites. They were, um, in, you know, if they had cuts, they were getting infected. There were all kinds of things. Dehydration was a big one. I mean, those, it was really, really hot. And, uh, and they were, you know, having to walk long distances. So that was a big deal. And Amy, generally, I, I wanted to ask you about policy, about NGOs, about health screening for refugees leaving conflict areas, uh, both to their, their first site of departure and then after resettlement. What, and how, how can we absorb the, these huge numbers with the resources that we have? Um, so I could speak specifically to the U.S. processes around that for refugees that are in the pipeline to come to the U.S. through our resettlement program. Um, prior to departure, they have a, um, a, a screening by a panel physician approved by CDC, specifically to screen for communicable diseases and, and things that uh, the U.S. requires prior to entry. Um, I think that's less about the refugees' health and more about our public health. Uh, and they flag um, issues for follow-up through, through a Class A, Class B system, so they have to be followed up upon arrival, either within seven days or within 30 days, depending on the severity of the condition. And then after the refugees arrive in the U.S., they similarly have a post-arrival health screening with a local Department of Health, or here it's public health, um, to s similarly for public health issues, screening for communicable <coughs> diseases, but also making the referrals to link them to local services and to the private health care system. Um, I think after that, they sort of face a lot of the same challenges that the rest of us do in accessing good health care and affording good health care in the U.S., but with the added challenges of needing translation, needing to find doctors that accept Medicaid, 
um, Medicaid expiring, um, and then also just the, the dearth of refugee-specific services, and especially mental health services. I think um, actually in Boston, we're sort of one of the lucky communities. We have more resources than most communities in that regard with the Boston Center for Refugee Health and Human Rights. I think there are only a handful of such um, agencies in the country that specialize in that. But it's definitely a, a challenge. Right, and as in our immigrant and refugee health program, we certainly don't have the capacity even to meet the need. And I think you're right. I think in Boston, we do have more resources um, than than many other places. Germany is reporting that the influx of refugees that they're seeing have um, overwhelmed their mental health system, and that these refugees have both experienced and witnessed really unspeakable traumas, and that half of the population of migrants they're seeing are experiencing profound mental health disorders. So, the, I mean, I, I see this as a huge challenge um, in Germany, but also as refugees go to, to other places. Um, we see this in Boston again with the Iraqi population that we have seen here, high rates of psychological trauma, and um, history of profound violence. So it, it's very, very challenging, and we do lack, lack the resources to meet that need. Um, also, sexual assault is very prevalent in post-conflict and conflict situations, and we're gonna be seeing the long-term consequences of sexual assault. I think it's, it's too early in Germany and in Europe right now to, to really um, be able to concentrate on what the long-term needs of this population will be in terms of health. So here we are. Um, I think we've, we've painted what the, what the dire situation is. And I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about solutions with our panelists and, and then with the audience, both online and in person. So we talked about the system being overwhelmed and collapsing, the humanitarian response system. I mean, to be fair, the United States has contributed over $4 billion to Syria since the start of the conflict in 2011, although we have resettled only 1,500 Syrian refugees. And think about that. Germany has 800,000. Um, with the promise to go up to perhaps 1.5 million over the next year. We've resettled only 1,500 people. Um, Senator Kerry has made the promise to increase the number of resettled refugees in the U.S. up 10,000 next year and then up to 100,000 by 2017. But there are huge, huge barriers to actual resettlement. And we're not really expecting any Syrian refugees in Boston anytime soon. And mostly that is because of bureaucratic um, barriers and security checks and just the logistical difficulty of actually getting these refugees in dire need through the process and then actually getting them settled um, to the United States. So what should we be doing? I, I can start with you, Amy. I mean, this is not really a European or Germany problem. This is an international problem. But what could the U.S. be doing? Um, I mean, I think, obviously, the, the only real solution to the refugee crisis is peace in Syria. So whatever leverage the U.S. has to um, work with its U.N. Security Council partners to, um, to try to bring peace to, to Syria, but that obviously is... Uh, well outside of the scope of our <laughs> discussion here. So I think the U.S. could be showing um, more leadership ar around resettlement numbers. It, historically, we have been the leader on taking the vast majority of um, the total global resettlement numbers. So total annual numbers are about 90,000, and the U.S. takes about 70,000 of those each year. So we are always in the lead on this. Um, it, there is a, put, a large push from the advocacy community, the NGO community, to increase the, the quotas for Syrians, but also for everybody else. They actually were pushing for um, an additional 100,000 just for Syrians over and above the usual 70,000 that we get. And what ended up 
happening was the announcement came that it would be gradually increased first to 85,000 this next year with 10 carved out for Syrians, which is a little ironic because there are already 18,000 in the pipeline just waiting to be interviewed. Um, and, and then in the following year, 2017, going up to uh, 100,000 without a, a specified carve out for Syrians. So there's more work to do on advocacy around that. I, th I do think the U.S. could be showing more leadership. On the other hand, there are such problems with, as you were saying, security checks and procedural inefficiencies and backlogs that any quota that we set is largely symbolic if you can't actually deliver those numbers through the pipeline. So there, there are those logistical issues as well. But I think one of the, the new, because that has always been the case in the refugee program, but I think a new factor is this uh, anti-immigrant speech that's on the rise and is much more organized now than before. And um, even reaching you know, many of the politicians and senators and representatives, they've been holding congressional hearings that challenge the very you know, existence of our refugee program um, and are afraid that it's part of a, a jihad caucus, um, Muslim conspiracy to, uh, to turn America into an Islamic country. So, and that, is, strangely, has actually gained more traction than you, than you would ever think possible and has actually become a real time suck for the refugee program, having to deflect those kinds of, um, I think, baseless claims. And um, Maria, did you, like, what is your perspective from Europe? I mean, did you from, from well, what Amy was saying, did you hear this kind I of mean, propaganda from Europe? And well, 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 certainly there, there was concern about that, especially in Hungary, but, but also, I mean, we heard it in Germany, you know, people worried, I mean, there's um, so many people coming in, uh, and that, that uh, Germany was kind of uh, putting people up in these kind of pop-up tents, like these massive tents, almost um, like a, like a, um, almost like a shower cap, I don't know how to describe it, but a it was dome. just, yeah, a dome, Trump's thank you, better, better language, um, but, um, this is no shower cap, but it looks like that to me. Um, but it was this giant thing. Uh, everybody needs an editor, so it's helpful. Um, but so, it's good, really, and you're a great writer. So, um, but they were, you know, they were just putting people wherever they could, and uh, in these these things that seemed, you know, otherworldly, and uh, and and people, it was startling people in the neighborhoods. You know, they weren't used to that, and uh, they were like, who are these folks coming in? You know, how do we know? And, and a lot of people, we did see people cross borders without getting background checked and things like that. But, but what I think was um, striking, I mean, you know, we, we read so much about Syria and Afghanistan and places like this, but um, when you look at the numbers, very few people actually make it to the United States from those countries and so far away. I mean, geography is the reason everybody's, um, big reason, thank you, <laughs> everyone's fl uh, focusing, into, you know, flowing to Europe. And, and, and that's striking to me, you know, because I think um, they're not your, our neighbors. We don't hear their stories for ourselves, and so there is this... Um, you know, I, I think there's a real need for that. It's our responsibility, I think, in the media, too, to try to, try to tell those stories, even though they're perhaps not here in as large numbers. Um, and and w another striking thing is so many Syrians speak English. So many Afghans, Afghans speak English. Um, I, I, mean, I, I didn't meet, really, I don't think I met a single refugee um, or migrant who spoke German. You know, and so they were all, you know, and it was the English-speaking countries that are largely not taking them, right? So uh, that, that was kind of some of the things we were hearing over there. Did they have any criticism of the U.S.? Did you hear? I'm just curious. Well, I, I think people were surprised. I mean, what, our first night in Lesbos, um, we, uh, we started working right away, and we went out and got some uh, people from the boats who were coming over at night. So that was happening, too. I mean, if you run out of uh, motor speed, you, you float uh, in when you can. And, uh, and they were like, but, you know, do, doesn't the United States know about this? Like, that, like they couldn't believe uh, Americans weren't well versed in what was happening to Syrians, that it took um, this little boy uh, dying, being found dead on the shores of Turkey to kind of just have this conversation. And I, and I you know, I, I sort of, I, it's a very good question. I didn't exactly have a good answer for them. I'm not sure that we do know about it. Um, I know it's very dangerous for journalists to report from Syria. Um, and even though there's lots of stuff going up on YouTube and everything like that, I don't know how much is independently verified. And, um, you know, I, I mean, you know, journalists want to tell the story. Uh, you know, don't, you know, a lot of uh, wonderful journalists have died covering these stories, and, um, and that is uh, tough. But, but there are other ways to tell these stories, and that's what we need to do, and we need to hear from people who think these stories should be told if we're not telling them, so. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's really important. And I think the point that you made is only a small number of refugees are resettled into third countries like the U.S. as part of a durable solution. And I'll tell you from 
from my travels and my clinics and, and my experience, refugees don't want to come to the United States. They want to go home. Whether they're living in Eastern Chad, they want to return to Darfur, they want to return to Syria, they want to return to Iraq. Um, many of the Iraqi refugees that we're caring for now are struggling here. They want desperately to go back to Iraq. And some of them have returned to even a, better to be home than in a, and in a horribly dangerous situation than to be here. Um, it, so it, it's not like refugees are flooding to come to the U.S. for a better economic situation. They want safety, but really they want to be able to go back home. Um, you know, we talked about ending the war in, in Iraq. I think one of the other things I've heard discussed is bolstering the ability of the neighboring nations to actually integrate some of the Syrian refugees, like Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan. Um, so they're not living in camps, so they're integrated into society. We help make them become so self-sustainable, get them jobs, education as well, which seems to be a big push. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an, another area where the U.S. could show leadership as well um, the, in maybe attaching some conditions to the aid money that they send over there to, to help incentivize the host countries to grant work permits to refugees to allow the children to go to school. Um, I mean, the, the stories are, because the adults can't work, they're often sending their children out to beg and adopting all kinds of negative coping strategies that are just tearing these families apart. Um, and I, I think it, it's going to take a kind of a heavy hand and a large wallet to change the incentive system <laughs> around all of this. So that's anything else for me, their view about the big picture. I mean, I, I kind of like to turn to, you know, what can we do locally to, to help advocate for this, this crisis, this situation? Well you, well, you were one of the first to, to really like, you know, call, you know, make a public call for help about this. I mean, what, what, what do you see? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, really. That was in 2012, so. yeah. and I'll tell you, nobody listened to me. <laughs> the Sorry. Boston Globe totally turned it down. I mean, not, not me, not me. I didn't know about this. So, no. I would not have. I think it's fascinating. So, it's great work. No, and I, I think that those of us in the room that that do refugee care, you know, we know resources are scarce. We know the needs are great. And um, from my perspective, I think we need to think of more creative solutions and not just depending, you know, on the government to provide cash benefits or mass health. I'd like to see the private sector step up. I'd like to see universities offering English classes, for instance, because I'll tell you, it's really hard for refugees to get English classes. Um, I'd like to see them step up to do, the private sector and universities perhaps step up to do um, specific kind of job training. We need to get refugees in the workforce in Boston, um, and that's hard to do as well. Um, Health care, I think we could be more creative and more effective about delivering health care and um, perhaps creating a kind of community health worker model. Um, for one thing, as I mentioned, health, mental health care needs are great and we don't have a great system of delivering mental health to some of these refugee populations who don't, aren't familiar with our Western model of mental health care and community health workers, I think, you know, might be a great model. So what I'm saying is I think we need to think out of the box and think of creative local ways that we can help welcome and integrate populations. But I'd like to hear thoughts from both of you. I, I think those are great suggestions. I love the idea of community health workers here. I've seen that model in a lot of developing countries. Um, and we've actually, our agency has piloted that in Nairobi, Kenya with urban refugees, kind of transferring the model that's often used in refugee camps to go household by household, uh, delivering health news and, and basic health kits. Um, and, we've, and we're reaching out into the slum areas of Nairobi. So I know it can be done in an urban area and we're having good results with that. I think it, it would be great to see that here. Um, I think beyond helping local capacity, I mean, there are several refugee resettlement agencies um, in Massachusetts, in the Boston area, that I'm sure would welcome volunteers. There's an unaccompanied refugee minors program in Worcester. Um, 
that uh, is always looking for foster families, that we actually put together a list, um, and there are copies that we're leaving behind if anybody's interested, of uh, ways that you can engage locally, and then also um, national advocacy opportunities in terms of congressional hearings, petitions to sign, um, calling your senators and representatives. And we do, we have a, a table with um, some resources that you can pick up on the way out um, by the door. Okay, I, I'd like to open it up now um, to audience questions. And I think we have somebody with microphones that are going to be, here's somebody over here. Thank you very much. You did ask what could the U.S. do, and I would suggest one of the things that you mentioned, why was this sudden influx, and it was the World Food Program cutting down its allocations, taking people off the rolls, and reducing the amounts. The World Food Program is an incredibly efficient, effective organization, and they are also buying acceptance in the recipient countries, in Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey, by giving people vouchers that allow them to purchase in the local markets. They are stimulating the local economy and they are very popular for that reason. These are poor areas where these camps are or where they're being resettled and suddenly to have them not with any food, trying, having to, to, to do whatever they have to do to get food is something. Now at Christmas last year, around the time of Christmas, World Food Program announced that they were 70 million short, they did a crowdsourcing, and they were very successful in raising that sort of money. But the reality is the US government could put a lot of money very quickly through the World Food Program in a highly effective way that would be one of the ways of stopping the, the egress. Now, winter is about to hit Europe. Imagine if we have these hundreds of thousands of people walking at this time in two months' time. That'll be a far greater disaster. And that is something Congress and our congressmen and our senators could do as an emergency allocation. We already give a lot of money to World Food Program. To give another few hundred million is well within Congress's emergency response. And I really think that's something people aren't talking about, but they really should be. I think that's an excellent point. And that's a way that I think we can all advocate here is to um, bring it up with our representatives. That's excellent. Do we have other questions? Comments? Uh, do you think that the, um, the international distinctions are viable anymore? What I mean by that is, is that you know refugees have to show that they have well-founded fear of returning because of persecution on account of various factors, uh, as opposed to my, what we call migrants, which are coming for economic purposes. And it seems to me that the distinction is no longer valid in many, I mean, somebody has to have a livelihood, and so they're leaving their country because there's the impact of war over the, over the decades now. Uh, it means that they can't support themselves, whether they're being attacked or whether they're being, is, is a distinction that I, seems to me is blurring and may not be viable anymore. I, I think that's an excellent point. Well, I'm Dr. glad you think so. Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and l let me, I, does everybody, first of all, understand um, the definition of a refugee versus a migrant? And maybe just let me um, state that. And then I think this is, a, this is another huge area of debate, and it's really important. A refugee is, by definition, somebody who has a well-founded fear of persecution in their country based on five grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion or social group. And you have to, um, th there has to be a government actor within this persecution. Now, so you have to be particular, you have to be targeted on the basis of one of those five grounds. Now a migrant is somebody who crosses borders um, for economic reasons. A refugee legally has the right to cross a border and ask for political asylum. A migrant does not have that legal right. But when you have a situation like Syria, where the Assad regime is bombing everywhere, does it matter if you're targeted um, or if, if the bomb just fell on your house? Because either way, you're suffering. You're, it, I, so I'm not sure that's a real distinction in these current wars that are ongoing. 
Um, this refugee convention was set up after World War II. But I'm not, I agree with you. I'm not so sure that it's, it's valid today because I, d I don't know that we should be making that distinction with these current wars and what's happening to all the people. And I don't know if Maria or Amy, you want to comment on that? I mean, there's a lot of scholarship around that, and others have suggested that, too. I think definitely the lines are bl becoming blurred and will become even more blurred with more climate-induced migration. Um, and already the term refugee is sometimes used to apply to them, even though they don't fit the 51 convention definition. And I think the other argument is a lot of resources go into making these very subtle distinctions between these categories, and could those resources be better spent? Yeah. Um, Yeah, I, I agree. Um, other questions? Yes. Okay, then we have some over here. We have a question from Twitter. Oh. Um, are, there any, are there any implications uh, for drug and alcohol problems related to the refugee crisis? Uh, I, I mean, I didn't come across that, but. Um, you know, I, I don't. Amy, do you have any? I mean, I, I have not worked with the Syrians firsthand, but in general, the refugee populations that I've worked with have not had, those are sort of luxury items. <laughs> they have so, not had the luxury to have those problems. I will, I'll just answer that. In working with refugee populations coming into Boston and on the Syrian border, it, it's really a very, very small issue and um, very few substance abuse problems amongst these populations. Some questions over here? Can I just comment on that? Yes. There has been a prior experience with mass migration, which was from Kosovo into Macedonia. And there, there was a drug problem. The large numbers of people who came from Kosovo who'd had transplants, who were on chronic disease medications, who were on oncology regimens, mm. and they were coming into, there were 200,000 people moved, came in in one week from Kosovo into Macedonia. And the emergency health kits that the WHO and others provide are all acute infectious diseases, antiseptics, antibiotics. And what the people really needed was antihypertensives, oncologicals, anti um, immune suppressive types of medication. And that was a complete surprise to the system. And there have been other examples and other cases. Turkey had a terrible earthquake, and that was again the situation that when people were moved out, the provision of chronic medical care is something that is frequently neglected. So just uh, to be aware of that. Yeah. No, agreed. And we actually are seeing many chronic conditions in the current wave of Iraqi refugees that we're seeing in terms of cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, obesity, Etc. So, yes. Hi. Um, I usually live in Denmark when I don't live here. Um, and one of, one, of the things that happened, um, yeah. one of the things that happened was the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, like the Secretary of State, sent out flyers in the, uh, to Lebanon and Syria and, and the, the local areas mm -hmm. telling uh, whoever, whether they were refugees or immigrants, that they were not welcome in Denmark. I'd like to ask you guys, because that's, um, so what, what do you, how do you think that affected, and have you, did you hear about that like in, in, in Europe? And I, know, I don't think that Denmark is particularly popular because of that. Um, uh, and, and how do you think that affected uh, the whole situation, like the opposite we saw in Germany, right? I, I did hear about that and I found it ironic because Denmark actually in many other ways is a leader on these issues and has contributed a lot of money towards refugee issues and has the Danish Refugee Council which is excellent and has an excellent refugee resettlement they just program switched itself. The just like two months prior to summer, they, they the, the governments had changed. This is a new, completely different type of government. Very, very. influenced, I would say. Mm. I haven't heard whether that has had an effect on the decisions that Syrians are making, whether to move or not. Okay. Hi, I just have a question about the environmental concerns. 
be sanitation and other you know, activities of daily living. Who's in charge of that? Um, what, what are the policies in place? What are the processes in place for that? So in general, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees is in charge of camp management in connection with the host country. And in each situation, they determine who's the implementing partner in which sector. So they might have a sanitation implementing partner. And I don't know who those are in particular in these countries. Um, and then they would have a, a health care implementing partner. And so they, they subcontract, but they manage and coordinate those services. Um, and I'll say, in my experience, there is very little uniformity among camps. It depends on where the camp is, where the camp is, who's running it, how much money there is. We've seen despicable conditions in camps, Farshana, for one, um, and other camps not quite so bad. So, uh, I mean, in in Jordan, there were children dying of hypothermia and malnutrition. So. So I want to thank you, Maria, for being here. And now I'm going to put you on the spot as oh, a member sure. of the press. So I th actually think that this crisis, I don't know if it's more than others, but has really become very polarized through the press. And the use of words, very strategic, about whether or not people are called refugees and painted as um, victims or they're painted with the brush of Islamophobia and really racist uh, nastiness. And I wonder if you have thoughts about that. I think one of our issues is if we see that you know, beautiful little boy dead on a beach in Turkey as an innocent victim, then somehow that allows us to persecute or not humanize everyone else. And I, I really worry about the, the polarization that at least I've noticed, my students have noticed, um, in particularly, and again, all right, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm gonna oh, make you totally speak fine. for the press. But you know, I do think the way the press shapes the, the stories that get told, you know, are they good refugees or are they bad? Like all of that really influences how the population or the community responds. Right. Um. Well, I mean, uh, so yeah, I, do, I don't represent all media. I just represent the Boston Globe. Um, but, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think, um, I think it's, uh, and I never do this, by the way, but I, but I, uh, I, I actually uh, think this is an interesting question for people, too. Um, and I think uh, with the media, I mean, you know, obviously I'm very committed to being a journalist. Um, and the last thing I think of, when, frankly, when I cover a story is, um, is uh, you know, selling newspapers you know some people might might uh so they think that's all we think about and it's the last thing i want to get all my facts straight i want to get everything right um but i also subscribe to the paper so i try to get what i pay for and i really think people have to ask, thank you <laughs> i really think you know and i'm not going to put you on the spot if you subscribe to a newspaper but if you don't and if you or, or any kind of media you know i mean i think you really you know a lot of the media out there is partisan you know it's kind of stuff like you see you know, during wartime, you know what I mean? Like, like, like Nicaragua, all the papers used to be just one political party. You know, it can't be that way. You have to be able to go to the media and, um, and tell them all the different stories. And we have to be willing to listen and open and talking to, and being criticized, too. Um, so I, as a journalist, I, I guess I feel very responsible um, for trying to do my job. And I really feel it when I feel like I've missed something. Um, so I'm glad you pointed that out. Uh, I also think, uh, like I said before, it was very dangerous for journalists to work there. Um, when I was preparing to go down, go to Europe, um, I was rereading reports. And of course, Syria and, and Afghani Afghanis have been um, the number one refugee f group for like 30 years. And in the past handful of years, Syrians shot to number one. I mean, obviously, this is an extreme situation. Um, but, uh, but do most people know about that? No. I mean, do mo we, there's a lot of coverage about ISIS. Um, but the people I talked to were just as afraid, if not more afraid, of um, the um, Syrian government. So, I mean, would I go to Syria right now? You know, could I safely report from there? I don't know if that, that's, uh, the answer seems over resoundingly no. Um, and uh, and I, I wanna be here. <laughs> um, but uh, but so, so I, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is we have to be able to, to do this kind of work. And, um, and the, I think the Boston Globe took a big leap, you know, right now um, to be able to send us there to get this firsthand. 
Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but um, but I but I think if 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 we're not doing something that if you if people feel that that um, coverage is inaccurate, you should call us and tell us. You know, some journalists are very defensive. I'm sure you know I can be too sometimes, but I think I I much rather hear it. I'd much rather read about it. It just helps you get it right. So. Okay. Hello. So, Hi. unfortunately, we've reached the end of our hour, and uh, this has been a tremendous discussion and just really vibrant. But I, I want to thank the, the panelists for coming, Amy and Maria. And I really want to thank the audience for participation and, and for coming to this today, and for um, Harold for organizing it.